Greetings everyone. As you may have known, my last video series about the DIY power bank was a huge success thanks to all of you. And right now, I am doing everything I can to redesign the power bank for the commercial version because I want to make sure that everything in my design works and is safe and reliable. One of the major things I want to test is the extra DC to AC module. The inverter converts voltage from a DC battery into an AC voltage capable of powering AC devices. In my last video, this function is achieved through a DC to DC step down converter along with a 12 volt inverter module. Because I am constrained by commercial modules, the form factors which I want to test are not possible. Furthermore, while researching the background of how to design a safe and reliable inverter, I found that most of the so-called inverter designs on YouTube are absolute jokes, with zero voltage, temperature, and overcurrent protection, and a handful of decent inverter designs. Most of them use heavy and bulky iron core transformers, which makes the design not suitable for portable applications. So in this video, I will show you the principles and the method of how to design and build a small portable modified sine wave transformer that is safe, reliable, and efficient to use. And as for always, all the links to the 3D design files, PCB design files, and the code are all in the description. Now, I have to say a word of warning. Due to the nature of the inverter, this build uses high DC and AC voltages, which can easily kill you if you're not careful. Therefore, you are responsible for your own safety. With the warning out of the way, I would like to announce that this project is once again sponsored by JLC PCB, which from them you can get 5 PCBs for just $2. And with their easy EDA design software, it is very easy to integrate and streamline the prototype process of designing PCBs. And their SMT assembly service can save you quite a lot of time and effort compared to buying everything and hand soldering the SMT components. I will show you how I built my inverter prototype PCB and the order process later on in the video. Alright, let's see how a commercial mini inverter module works. Upon careful examination, you can see that there are two MOSFETs that is switching the input side of a small ferrite core transformer. The output of the transformer then goes into a full bridge rectifier, which turns the AC voltage of the transformer back into DC voltage. And the rectified DC voltage is being smoothed out by this high voltage capacitor here. Let's connect the module to power and measure it with an oscilloscope. Looking at the signal on the gate of the MOSFET, we can see that the MOSFET is being switched at around 35 kHz. And if we look at the signal on the other MOSFET, we can see that it is also switched at 35 kHz. But it is inverted compared to the first MOSFETs. And looking at the DC voltage across the output capacitor, it is clear that the transformer is stepping up the voltage, as the output is 146 volts DC. And this is the simple block diagram for the first stage of the inverter. Basically, two MOSFETs drive the primary side of a transformer in a push-pull configuration. This creates an AC voltage on the primary side of the transformer. The transformer likely had a winding ratio of around 1 to 12, which increases the input voltage by 12 times. This high voltage AC is then rectified by a full bridge rectifier and then is converted into a high voltage DC. Now, to get a high voltage DC to high voltage 60 Hz AC, which is what we want, we just need to reverse the polarity of the high voltage DC 60 times a second. There is a particular connection of transistor called a H-bridge, which allows the reversing of the polarity to be done electronically. In an H-bridge, the load is in the center, and when one opposing corner pair of MOSFETs turn on, one side of the load is connected to the positive, and the other side is connected to the negative. However, when the opposite sides of the MOSFET turn on, the polarity across the load reverses, and doing this 60 times a second gives you an AC voltage on the output. And as you can see, the MOSFET for the H-bridge is present on both inverter modules. Thus, 
The full block diagram for the modified sine wave inverter module looks like this, where the high voltage DC is fed into an H-bridge, and that H-bridge is driven by a controller to output 50 to 60 Hz modified sine wave. With the basic theory explained, we can start building the push-pull part of the circuit. To do that, we would first need a driver chip, and a common one is the SG3525. I'll include a link in the description that describes this chip in more detail. And to test the chip, this is the basic schematic I came up with. And so, it is time to get all the through-hole components and assemble everything on the breadboard. For this design, I used a 10 kilo ohm potentiometer on the frequency set pin. This way, I can adjust the frequency later. After the circuit is built, I hooked an oscilloscope up to the gate driver of both MOSFETs. And as you can see, the drive signals are opposite of each other, and the frequency is adjustable using the potentiometer. Now it is time for the transformer. For this small test version, I simply used an EE25 ferrite core transformer that I hide laying around. And this is how I winded the transformer. It is a simple 1 to 2 turns ratio, which means there are 10 turns on the primary side and 20 turns on the secondary side. And because this is going to be used as a push-pull transformer, the primary turns are multiplied by 2. I loosely wound the transformer and insulated both windings with a layer of cap-down tape. And then I soldered some leads as pin headers so I can attach them onto the breadboard. After attaching the transformer to the breadboard and connecting it in this manner, I powered on the circuit with 12 volts DC, and then measured the output, which shows around 24 volts AC RMS, which is exactly double the input voltage. The reason why I chose such a low turns ratio is because 24 volt AC is still safe to touch. Now, to turn the high frequency AC output back into DC, the solution is simple. Simply connect a full bridge rectifier with a few filtering capacitors and connecting this to a voltage meter says that there is 23 volts DC on the output. However, this voltage is only stable without any load. Even with a small amount of load, the voltage drops as much as 3 volts. So I went back into the schematic and drew up a simple voltage feedback system. The output voltage is stabilized based on the value set by the potentiometer. After setting the output voltage to 19 volts, the voltage becomes quite stable and consistent despite increasing load. And this concludes the push-pull parts of the inverter circuit. As for the H-bridge driver part, I made this simple schematic of an H-bridge and built it onto the breadboard. And as you can see, when I insert a signal into one side of the MOSFET, the voltage turns positive, and on the other side, the voltage turns negative. So now, all we need is something to generate the signals in order to produce the modified sine wave. To generate the signals, it is actually quite simple, as all that's needed is the Arduino and the Timer1 library. So I wrote a simple sketch and uploaded it onto the Arduino, and I pushed the Arduino onto the breadboard and connected it with the oscilloscope. And as you can see, the output of the Arduino pins 9 and 10 shows the correct pulses. After connecting the Arduino with the H-bridge, a clear 60 Hz modified sine wave is generated on the output. Now, you might think that we are done right now with the prototype. However, there are no input and output isolation between the high voltage and low voltage side. So to isolate the input and output grounds, there's a simple device called the octocoupler, and I will briefly show how it works. Inside the octocoupler, on one side there's an LED, and on the other side there's a transistor. Whether or not the transistor turns on depends on if the LED is shining. So I connected the LED side to my power supply, and the other side to a 5 volt source with an LED attached. When I turn up the voltage on my power supply, the LED connected to the transistor begins to shine. But notice how these two voltage sources are completely separate, and we will use this principle to separate the low voltage side and the high voltage side of the inverter circuit. 
the three places that need separation is the H-bridge drive signals and the feedback pin. After putting in the octocouplers, I retested the circuit and it still works just the same. One final thing, to measure the current of the device, one simple solution is to use a shunt resistor at the input of the push-pull converter. And by measuring the voltage across the shunt resistor, we can see that the voltage across the shunt resistor corresponds to the amount of current that the circuit is drawing. So we can easily use this method with analog read on the Arduino to set the overcurrent limit and overcurrent protection. After this, it is finally time for the custom PCB. The overall schematic is split into roughly four parts. First is the DC to DC converter. This is responsible for powering the cooling fan as well as the SG3525IC. And the control unit of the inverter is powered by ATmega328P chip, which is the same chip present on Arduino Uno, Pro Mini, and Nano boards. The microcontroller controls the indicator LED, the temperature control pin. It also connects directly to the SG3525 enable pin, which gives the Arduino the authority to turn on and off the inverter stage. The second part is the push-pull converter stage, which is responsible for turning the low voltage DC into 155 volts DC. The third is the H-bridge stage, which is four n-channel high voltage MOSFETs driving the output. Now, if you look at the diagram, you will notice that one special thing is a transformer. It has a standard center tapped winding on the primary side, but if you notice, there is a total of four center tap winding on the secondary side. And this is because that to drive the MOSFETs, we cannot use the high voltage DC as the maximum voltage on each MOSFET gate can only be around 20 volts. The three center tapped windings on the secondary is to supply the 10 to 20 volt voltage for the gate of the MOSFET. All the secondary center tapped windings are 2x2 two two turns to keep the voltage low. However, the high voltage winding ratio is much more nuanced than that. And it is given by this formula. And you can pause the video on the screen and calculate the winding ratio. Since my inverter has to work from 11 to 21 volts, I dedicated two voltage ranges and optimized the winding ratio for both voltage ranges. And because of this, there is a switch on the output of the transformer to manually select either winding. Now, for the primary winding ratio, it is actually a quite complex set of equations and constants. However, there's an app that takes care of all this complicated calculation for you. All you have to do is to enter in the right setup values and the part number of the Farad core you have. And for the frequency, I recommend between 50 and 100 kilohertz. Just simply adjust the values in the program until it gives you a valid solution. And for the windings, simply multiply your primary winding by the winding ratio to get the secondary winding number. And after all the calculation, this is what my transformer configuration looks like. After making sure all the math checks out, I ordered my prototype PCB using JLC PCB and its SMT assembly process. And in the meantime, we can wind the transformer. Based on the calculations, the primary winding is going to be subjected to around 15 amps of current. You may think that requires very thick enameled copper wires. However, this is not the case, and that is because something called the skin effect. Basically, when high frequency AC is passing through a wire, the higher the frequency, the higher the tendency that the electrons are going to collect on the surface of the conductor. Because of this, most of the current flows through only the skin and causes huge AC resistances in the transformer, which is not what we want. To solve this issue, it is quite simple, and that is to increase the surface area of the conductor. And to do that, I am going to use 20 strand of this 28 gauge wire. And with the wires made, the winding process can begin. Attach heat shrink tubing to the bundle of wires and begin winding the first three turns of the primary coil. After that is done, cover the primary coil with two layers of Kapton tape 
and make sure there is no exposed enameled copper wire to come in contact with the secondary coil. For the secondary coil, since the current is low and the voltage is high, thick wires are not required, so two strands of 28 gauge wire is sufficient. Begin winding the secondary coil and make sure to insulate each layer of winding with Kapton tape. After the first portion of the secondary is done, insulate it with Kapton tape and begin winding the second portion of the secondary winding. After the major secondary winding is done and covered with tape, wind the second half of the primary coil. The reason we sandwich the secondary coil between the primary coil is for even flux density. It is also to prevent the bulging of the return wires. Wind the rest of the three secondary windings in much of the same way as before. However, with the last two secondary windings, it is going to be connected externally to the board. So make sure all the wires are sticking out. After all the windings are complete, solder the winding wires to the transformer pins. And after soldering the wires, use a voltmeter to check that there are no separate windings that are conductive with each other. To finish off the transformer, I put some thermal glue on the joints and close the ferrite core up. And then I wrap the whole thing with tape. And with that, the transformer build is now complete. After a few days, the PCBs arrived for me and they all have the SMT parts already soldered. So the rest of the build are going to be through hole components only. Because of the Arduino chip is fresh from the factory, it needs to have a bootloader on it before we can program it, which you can do through these six pins. There are many tutorials online of how to do this, so I won't go over it here. Instead, I will include a link in the description for it. After burning the bootloader, you can now program the board with a standard FTDI adapter in the same way that you would program an Arduino Pro Mini. As a reminder, the code is in the description. The code checks for the input voltage, output voltage, temperature, current, and which terminal is selected for the output voltage. And only when all these parameters are within safety limits will the Arduino turn on the inverter. And for the soldering, I basically follow the parts on the schematic. A few things worthy of note. For the MOSFETs, I suggest you choose one with the lowest on resistance for the highest efficiency. And also, make sure you put some heatsink onto the MOSFETs. I found out later that my heatsinks are too small, so make sure you use slightly larger ones. And also make sure the secondary transformer wires are in the correct holes. And after connecting the board to power, I was extremely relieved to see that not only nothing blew up, it also showed a beautiful modified 60Hz sine wave on the output. And furthermore, the voltage is also correct of around 114 volts. Now, it is time for the final touches, which is adding a mini 12 volt cooling fan and a 100 kilo ohm NTC thermistor on the MOSFET. Also, add in the 3D printed bracket on the switches so they move in unison. And finally, I found that for some reason, my inverter does not work with some switch mode power supplies. However, this can be easily fixed by adding an inductor on the output. For my inductor, I think it was around 3 millihenries. However, I don't really know why this happens. So if any of you knows what's going on, please write in the comments and that will be greatly appreciated. Now, the inverter PCB assembly is essentially complete, and I did some simple tests to make sure all of it work. Then, I got the 3D printed case and mounted everything inside of it. This step is crucial as it makes the inverter safe to handle. And after assembling the inverter, it still worked as expected. Since I do not have a proper AC load to tell, I am going to test out the inverter using my 100 watt flashlight. And as you can see, the inverter is able to power the flashlight just fine. And of course, the single socket on the inverter can be adapted to an extension cord and can be used to power any AC devices as long as the total power does not exceed 150 watts. And the inverter can power inductive loads just fine, such as this fan, which is pretty good. So that is it for this project. I hope you found this information useful. As for always, if you enjoyed this video, 
please make sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already done so to my channel. And I will continue my work on the commercial power bank project and other more interesting projects in the future. And I appreciate any feedback and suggestions on this project. And until next time, thanks for watching.